Ave Maria Purissima, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Uh, I'll be relying very heavily on the work of others, and as usual, I have a cut and paste of the quotes. I will start today with a story from the Liber Pontificalis. Okay, great, so what is the Liber Pontificalis? Well, in English, uh, Liber Pontificalis means the book of the popes. It has short biographies of popes from uh, St. Peter up to Pope Stephen V, who uh, ruled or died actually in 891. Although there were later additions to the book which brought the list up to the 15th century. So the Liber Pontificalis is an ancient book containing short biographies of the popes from St. Peter to Stephen V, who died in 891. Scholars think that the authors of the Liber Pontificalis were clerks that were attached to the papal court. The book was accepted at face value right up into the 1700s, but nowadays there's some doubt regarding the details of the early biographies, since most scholars think that the early entries in the work weren't written till the uh, fifth or sixth century. As one author notes, and I quote, the historical value of the Liber Pontificalis varies. The Catholic Encyclopedia calls the early biographies up to about the year 500, full of errors and historically untenable. And in this estimation, most scholars seem to be in agreement. The biographies from 500 through the 800s, however, are generally considered to be historically reliable. The value of the Liber Pontificalis, then, is not so much that it's an accurate history of the early church at Rome, as much as it's a reflection of what the early medieval Roman church believed about its own history. The Liber Pontificalis, at least the entries up to Pope Anastasius, tells us much more about what the 7th and 8th century Roman church believed than what actually happened in the first four centuries, close quote. Okay, so the Liber Pontificalis is an ancient book containing short biographies of the popes from St. Peter up to Pope Stephen V, who dies in 891. The biographies from the 500s to the 800 are generally considered to be historically reliable. Most scholars think the earlier entries in the work weren't written until centuries after the fact, fifth or sixth centuries, and so the historical accuracy of those earlier biographies is debated. So today, what we're going to do is consider one story from the Liber Pontificalis, then after considering that, ask ourselves about the historical value of the data, and then consider the implications. So first, we'll look at an event reported to be historical. Second, we'll consider the historical value of the data, and third, the implications, all right? Now, in order to really appreciate what we're going to consider, we need to have one more uh, bit of background information here. During the Roman persecutions, a common test to which the pagan judges would put our ancestors in the faith was to demand that they take a pinch of incense and place it on burning coals that were placed on an altar in front of an image of the emperor. Why was placing a pinch of incense in front of the image of the emperor a test? because the offering incense before the Roman emperor or before his image was understood to be an explicit recognition of his so-called divinity, of his demand to be treated as a god. So if a Christian willingly offered incense to the emperor or to his image, he committed an act of idolatry and apostatized from the true faith. And if he refused to offer the incense, then he was martyred. Okay. So first, we're going to consider an event reported to be historical. Secondly, consider the historical value of the data. And thirdly, consider some of the implications. The historical event. This is the story of Pope Marcellinus. He's Pope from 296 to 304 during the great persecution of Diocletian. I will quote from Liber Pontificalis. Quote, Marcellinus, by nationality a Roman, the son of Projectus, occupied the sea eight years, two months, and 25 days. He was bishop in the time of Diocletian of Maximian, from July 1st in the sixth consulship of Diocletian and the second of Constantius. Now, they dated things by consulships. What this means, the sixth consulship of Diocletian and the second of Constantius is A.D. 296. So he's, he's bishop of Rome from A.D. 296, until the year when Diocletian was consul for the ninth time and Maximian for the eighth, which is A.D. 304. 
At that time, there was a great persecution, so that within 30 days, 17,000 Christians of both sexes in diverse provinces were crowned with martyrdom. For this reason, Marcellinus himself was hailed to sacrifice that he might offer incense, and he did it. Close quote. During the persecution of Diocletian, Marcellinus himself was hailed to sacrifice that he might offer incense, and he did it. That's a public act of apostasy. The offering of incense before the Roman emperor or before his image is an explicit recognition of his demand to be treated as a god. So if a Christian willingly offered incense to the emperor or to his image, he committed an act of idolatry and apostatized from the faith. There's more historical data. Another manuscript of the leader Pontificalis contains more information about this episode, and I quote, And after a few days, a synod was held in the province of Campania in the city of Sinuessa, which is now known as Rocco di Mandragone. And after a few days, a synod was held in the province of Campania in the city of Sinuessa, where with his own lips, he, Pope Marcellinus, professed his penitence in the presence of 180 bishops. He wore a garment of hair cloth and ashes upon his head and repented, saying that he had sinned." Close quote. And there's still more historical data. This story is found in yet another document called The Passion of Marcellinus, which was written sometime around the year 500. Quote, this document tells of the apostasy of Marcellinus and purports to contain some of the proceedings of the Synod of Sinuessa. In the Passion of Marcellinus, Marcellinus admits his apostasy and asks the Synod to pass judgment on him. The Synod, however, refuses to enter into judgment on the Pope, stating that, quote, the first see is judged by no one, close quote, which means no one can judge the Pope. And that's actually true. Okay, now before we consider the historical value of the data, let's make sure we all have a clear understanding of what we just heard. We just heard about a Pope, Marcellinus, being dragged before a pagan judge during the persecution of Diocletian, be order, being ordered to offer sacrifice to an image of the emperor, which is an explicit recognition that the emperor be treated as a god. And the pope did it. In other words, the pope publicly committed an act of idolatry and apostatized from the faith. And later that pope, clothed in sackcloth and ashes, appeared before a synod of bishops, repenting of his sin and asking the synod to pass judgment on him, but the synod refused saying that no one can judge the Pope. That's an explicit teaching of the church, that no one can judge the Pope. Okay, so that's the historical event. Now let's consider the value of this data, the historical value of the data. We'll rely on another author's summary, summary who starts by asking, the story of Pope Marcellinus was written at a minimum of 250 years after the fact, and most likely more. Given the admittedly poor historicity of the Liber Pontificalis, could the whole episode have been a fabrication? It's a really good question. Because this is a sermon, we'll only hit the high points of the answer since we don't have the time to get into all the details. So what follows is just a running paraphrase. On the side of fabrication, the evidence against the apostasy of Marcellinus boils down to questioning whether this particular synod of Sinuessa ever occurred since no contemporary records of that synod have been discovered. But just because no contemporary records of the synod have yet been discovered doesn't mean that it never happened. It just means they don't have any contemporary records of it. When my grandpa applied for Social Security, he didn't have any birth or baptismal certificates. But that didn't mean he hadn't been born or that he wasn't baptized. It just meant that he didn't have the paperwork to prove it. Secondly, even if the Synod of Sinuessa never happened, that doesn't mean that Marcellinus never apostatized. They're not the same events. There are two events here. One concerns him being hauled before the judge and burning a pinch of incense. The other concerns him presenting himself before a Synod of Bishops and repenting. Okay, so long and short of it is that the argument that Marcellinus never apostatized is simply conjecture. At best, it has some plausibility, but even at best, it's still only a conjecture. Now let's ask if there's any positive evidence to the contrary positive evidence that Marcellinus did apostatize. As a matter of fact, there is. To begin with, the Roman chronograph, it's a kind of early uh, Christian calendar that contained a list of the councils and the reigning popes, and it goes up to 354. 
it admit, omits any mention of Pope Marcellinus. A similar calendar that had been issued uh, two decades before in 336 also fails to mention him. Taken collectively, it's difficult to see how these omissions were not intentional. The Eastern Eusebius, in fact, uh, he became the Bishop of Caesarea in 314, so he's a contemporary of Marcellinus, mentions Marcellinus in his history, but he says only cryptically that the persecution also affected him. In what sense was he affected? Furthermore, by the late fourth century, rumors of the Pope's apostasy had spread. The schismatic uh, Donatist bishops of North Africa cited the apostasy of Marcellinus as proof that the mainstream Catholic clergy were corrupt and weak and a bunch of compromisers. I mean, when you read the Donatist arguments, it's just astonishing. In substance, they're the same as the SSPX arguments. The, 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 the uh, similarities of their behavior in the arguments is just startling. It's almost unbelievable. Anyway, so the schismatic Donatist bishops cite this apostasy as proof that the mainstream Catholic clergy are corrupt and weak and a bunch of compromisers. Now these rumors of apostasy are circulating by the late 380s, well within human memory of the events, and centuries before the writing of the Lever Pontificalis or the Passion of Marcellinus. A letter written about 400 AD by a Donatist named Petillion, a letter, that, a letter that's attacking the very legitimacy of the Catholic Church accuses Marcellinus of not only offering up incense, but also of handing over the sacred books. Now, they call that being a traditory. That's where we get the word traitor, hanging, handing over the sacred books. St. Augustine himself responds to these claims. He states, in regards to Petillion, and I quote, You mentioned the bishops whom you accuse of having delivered up the sacred books. We, on our part, answer, either you fail in your proof, and so it concerns no one at all, or you succeed, and then it still has no concern with us, for they have borne their own burden, whether it be good or bad, and we indeed believe that it was good. But of whatever character it was, yet it was their own, just as your bad men have borne their own burden, and neither you theirs, nor they yours." Close quote, St. Augustine. In other words, St. Augustine does not absolutely deny the truth of the charge. He just says that Petillion hasn't offered any proof for his accusation, and beyond that, St. Augustine says that even if the charges were true, even if Pope Marcellinus did apostatize, it still has no concern with us. In other words, whether or not this particular pope offered incense under duress is neither here nor there, as far as the legitimacy of the church is concerned. Whatever burden Marcellinus may have succumbed to in his day is of no concern to the Donatist arguments against the holiness of the Catholic Church. The deeds of bad men do not negate the witness of good men. In other words, St. Augustine is familiar with the charges against Marcellinus and personally believes them to be false, but he's not absolutely certain, so he qualifies his answer. So given that Marcellinus' name was left out of two practically contemporary lists of popes, Given that St. Augustine's defense of him is very qualified, it seems very plausible to say this pope was involved in something unsavory during the great persecution. The only explanation ever given as to what this unsavory activity was is that it was apostasy, as noted in the Liber Pontificalis, the Passion of Marcellinus, the Letter of Petillion, and the response of St. Augustine. So we can't say that his apostasy is certain, but on the one hand, we can say the argument that Marcellinus never apostatized is at best simply a conjecture, and on the other hand, we can say there are probable gones for assuming there's a core of truth in the story of the apostasy of Pope Marcellinus. Now the final point to consider when thinking about the historical value of this data is that this story was taken at face value by the Catholics in Rome throughout the centuries, even though modern scholars might dispute the particulars of the story, no modern scholar is going to dispute the fact that for over a thousand years, the apostasy of Pope Marcellinus was accepted as factual by historians of the Catholic Church who actually lived in Rome itself. During that time, everyone would have agreed, oh yeah, that really happened, the Pope really did do that. No one lost any sleep over it. It was just something that happened. Okay, so we've considered the historical event, we've considered value of the data. Now let's consider some of the implications. The implications of the apostasy of Pope Marcellinus. Some so-called traditionalists take it for granted 
that a pope spouting off some heresy by that very fact loses his office. Obviously what we have in the case of Pope Marcellinus is not heresy but apostasy, which is even worse. And these same people commonly state that a public act of apostasy by that very fact would result in loss of office since apostasy, like heresy, cuts one off from the church. But we all know that to believe something that is objectively speaking heretical and to be a heretic are two quite different things. One of the points of preaching and teaching catechism is to clear up erroneous and or heretical beliefs. The fact that someone may believe something that is objectively speaking heretical does not mean that he's a heretic. It may just mean that he's confused or ignorant. A true heretic always has an obstinate attitude regarding the error. Heresy always involves an obstinate, stubborn refusal to be corrected. That's the keynote. And just as there's no true heresy without an obstinate, stubborn refusal to believe the teaching of the church, so also there's no true apostasy without a willful repudiation of the faith. So how does this apply to Pope Marcellinus? Well, the fact that Pope Marcellinus may have committed a formal act of apostasy does not necessarily mean that he truly rejected the faith. As we'll see, we have every reason to believe that he suffered a momentary lapse due to weakness and fear. And that's just exactly what happened to St. Peter. Our Lord promised Peter explicitly that his faith wouldn't fail. You can read that in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 22 and verse 32. But in the courtyard, Peter not only disowns our Lord, but St. Matthew's Gospel tells us explicitly that St. Peter actually denied our Lord with an oath. But he didn't lose the faith. Losing the faith, becoming a true heretic, becoming a true apostate is something much deeper than a momentary lapse driven by weakness or fear. So even though it's always scandalous when the Pope does something damaging to the faith, or worse yet, commits a public act of apostasy like St. Peter or Marcellinus, we simply don't have the grounds for assuming the Pope has lost the faith since no one can judge the Pope. The Roman Church assumed that Marcellinus did apostatize, but never suggested that by his apostasy he lost the papacy or fell from office. Yes, he was admitted from some papal lists put together in the middle 300s, but his name appears in all the later lists, and there's no evidence of an anti-pope during his lifetime. Everyone clearly regarded Marcellinus as a legitimate pope, both before and after his apostasy. And there's another important and very practical lesson here. Notice what we don't see here. We don't see everyone freaking out, doing cartwheels and back springs and running around like chicken, chickens with their heads cut off in response to the fact that the Pope made an absolutely spectacular denial of Christ and formally worshiped a pagan god. Popes can do some crazy and unidentifying things, and occasionally they have. But that shouldn't shake our faith one little bit. If and when a pope does something fairly nutty, well, we just have to pray harder. Say another decade of the rosary for him. And then if you're still worked up, relax. Don't, go, don't worry, go have another cold one. Don't lose your inner peace. You can't grow in holiness if you don't keep your inner peace. Which brings me around to more current events. No one can reasonably deny that what's going on in Rome is pretty bizarre. The strange things, our Holy Father says, the treatment of the Franciscans of the Immaculate, the Synod, round one, round two coming up, and that ain't going to be an eight-second ride. You better be prayed up. The encyclical, as you know, I'm trained as a scientist. I recommend that you can just watch Lord Christopher Monckton if you want a reasonable discussion of climate change. But that being said, frankly, the reaction of the encyclical, the reaction of the encyclical is itself premature. The thing is almost 200 pages long. It's going to take some time to digest and reflect on, and it's just plain, flat, unreasonable to expect a thoughtful, measured, prayerful response to something like that in a day or two. 
And all that is not to say that the pope is above criticism. He's not above criticism. I just spent 20 minutes hammering on a pope for apostasy. But if we're going to engage in criticism, it has to come from a place of peace, from a place of prayer, from a real necessity, with a real intention of extending him every possible benefit of the doubt, and from a true filial devotion to him. If ever the fourth commandment applied anywhere, it has to apply to our relationship with the Holy Father. Devotion doesn't mean we have to like him, it means we have to love him. And that's not the same thing. Everybody loves their teenagers, even though they don't always like them. It's okay to like the Pope, but that doesn't matter. You have to love him. And we have to be careful. When we treat of the Vicar of Christ, we have to be careful. But that's not really what we're seeing these days, is it? No, we're seeing more and more insane responses to all the chaos from above. We have bloggers and journalists stating as if they know that Francis has lost the faith, casting doubts upon his beatifications, publicly questioning the infallibility of his canonizations, mocking him, calling him all kinds of things, I won't repeat here or anywhere else. So even though I think that many bloggers perform a very important, even a vital function, they really do, still it's quite possible to do the right thing in the wrong way. James 3.1 reminds us that not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you realize we will be judged more strictly. That's the word of God. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you realize that we will be judged more strictly. Since bloggers have appointed themselves to be teachers, I can only assume that either many of them do not read their Bibles or else they do not believe that God means exactly what he says. Teachers will be judged more strictly. In the spirit of fraternal charity, I've actually tried to privately correct some traditional bloggers and journalists on various topics where they're actually clearly wrong and departing from Catholic teaching in, ser in serious matters. I've communicated with them regarding serious errors on topics such as usury, beatifications, canonizations, and schism. In every case, save one, regardless of the evidence, including solemn judgments of councils and popes, the people I've communicated with have furiously rendered their own private judgments and in spite of any evidence to the contrary, obstinately stuck with it. So I've given up on them. Their minds are made up, and it doesn't matter what sort of evidence you bring forth. The people that I've had dealings with are not in love with the truth. So for my money, a lot of these people ought to be getting fitted for asbestos suits, because there's every indication that they're going to need them. If you must visit Catholic blogs, be careful. Be very careful about the blogs you visit, and especially for what passes for analysis on them. Be very careful. One last thought before we close. God has regard for his vicar. You forget that at your own peril. A lot of people in our day and age have forgotten that. But you must never, ever forget that God has regard for his vicar. If you turn to April 26th in your missal, you'll see that it's the feast day of St. Cletus. He's the third pope. You also see that St. Cletus shares his feast day with another saint, a saint named Marcellinus. You see, even though Marcellinus committed a public act of apostasy, when he offered a pinch of incense to Caesar, he repented. The leader of Pontificalis tells us, quote, Marcellinus himself was dragged to sacrifice that he might offer incense, and he did it. And after a few days, inspired by penitence, he was beheaded by the same Diocletian and crowned with martyrdom for the faith of Christ. After a few days, inspired by penitence, he was beheaded by the same Diocletian and crowned with martyrdom for the faith of Christ. Be very, very careful about jumping to conclusions about our Holy Father. If the Pope does something crazy, it isn't the first time. Calm down, say another decade of your rosary form, and never forget 
that God has regard for his vicar. Pope St. Marcellinus, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.